Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to do something a little different. I'm not going to be doing a trailer reaction. Instead, I'm going to give you my initial thoughts slash a mini spoiler review in regards to the newest Marvel film out, which is Eternals. Um, just so you guys know, heads up, ignore the little kittens behind me. I got two kittens, as you can see on my bed. Uh, so yeah, they'll be there in the background. I hope they're not too distracting, but they're very cute little kittens, all right? But other than that, guys, I do want to talk about Eternals with you due to the fact that lately um, it has made a lot of headlines, but not in a very positive way. Um, a lot of people are split on this movie. It is the first MCU movie to get a Rotten Tomato score, um, which is says a lot. I'm not going to lie. I mean, a lot of franchises would kill to have, like, you know, a, a Rotten movie to come out after, like, 25 other projects. I mean... Out of the 25 movies Marvel has done, this is the first rotten one. I mean, a lot of people are saying it was going to happen eventually. And true, I will agree with that. It probably was going to happen eventually. Nobody's perfect. We make mistakes. This happens to be the first mistake, so to say, rotten score from Marvel. But the, the fact that it's, it was over out, like after a decade of 25 Marvel projects, MCU projects, says a lot about the MCU's track record. So, not, not too shabby, alright? Uh, but yeah, so this is the first rotten MCU movie by critics. Um, and it's funny because critics were meh with the movie. Um, it, even in terms of audiences, this could be debatable. Um, they said the best... Um, rating to look at in regards to audiences is cinema score and it did receive a low uh rating from cinema score from audiences it got like a b minus or a b something like that um which is pretty low i think the other one to have gotten something like that was the incredible hulk and that was back in 2008 um so yeah there was that and then um uh, but you could also argue the fact with rotten tomatoes the audience score was pretty high it was it's currently right now at 80 percent it was at 86 but now it's at 80 percent um again some people would probably look more to cinema score as a reliable source than the audience score for rotten tomatoes but i'll just leave it there for you guys to debate about that but yeah this movie eternals has caused a lot of debate um, and it's funny because before going into the movie, due to the fact that I was hearing so many mixed messages about this movie, I didn't really know what to expect from this movie. I didn't know how I was going to feel after I saw the movie. I was really curious. I was really curious to know what about this movie is causing such a division? How am I going to react to those factors of what's causing the division. I really did not know. And the funny thing is, if you guys check out my YouTube channel, I did do a couple of trailer reactions in regards to Eternals. Um, one of them was a trailer reaction, which was the first trailer, and then the second trailer, I did more of a review on the trailer as to how what like my, my thoughts on the trailer. And truth be told, now that I think back to watching those trailers, even then, watching the two trailers, I still did not know how to feel about the movie. If you guys do a comparison, from for let's just stick with Phase 4 for now, because I'm not going to have you guys go all the way back to my other Marvel trailer reactions, but just sticking with the Phase 4 um, movies, I'm not going to include the shows, I feel like that's going to be its own thing, but just to talk about the movies, with Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and now Eternals. Spider-Man hasn't come out yet, so I'm not going to put that in, this, in the discussion just yet. Let, let's wait on Spider-Man. But with Black Widow, when I saw the trailers, I didn't feel anything for the movie. I could care less about it, and that's how I felt when I saw the trailers. When I went and saw the movie, I still felt the same way. I just didn't care about it. So it's like my reaction to the trailer was kind of interest, interesting enough is how I felt after leaving the movie. It's what I expected, and that's what I got didn't care too much for the movie and I ended up not caring for it after I saw the movie and as you guys know you guys probably seen it here and there that the movie for Black Widow some people do like it some did not um but it has 
kind of um, it had, the movie has its problems. It does have its problems, and it had a whole negative atmosphere then with the whole um, lawsuit from Scarlett Johansson and whatnot. So there was a whole lot of negative baggage also going around that movie. Then Shang Chi, right, was afterwards. If you guys watch my trailer reactions for Shang Chi, I was like super excited for that movie. I, that trailer did not; the, the two trailers did not disappoint, and the movie itself did not disappoint. Something about the, the, the vibes as to what the trailer was selling to the audience worked. And it resulted into a fantastic movie. I mean, what you saw in the trailer for Shang-Chi, some people said that the trailers for Shang-Chi were mediocre. Um, you know, again, that's subjective. That's up to you guys as to how you felt about it. Me, personally, the trailers got me hyped. And I was so excited for the movie. And when I saw the movie, I was very satisfied. I was surprised by even some of the other things that they didn't show in the trailer, which was a good thing, because you want to walk out of the theater surprised and loving the movie. So Shang-Chi was like at the top tier list for Marvel. I really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, that movie was superb. Um, so yeah, I, 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 when I saw the trailers, I felt something, I felt really excited, and then now coming out of the theater after watching Shang-Chi, I was very satisfied. So there's that. Now with the Eternals. Again, going back to my trailer reactions and my thoughts on the trailers, I didn't know how to feel. I was like, hmm, okay, this is different, but okay. I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Because if we've seen Marvel, Marvel is able to take unknown characters and make them into A-list characters, right? I mean, think about it. Before the MCU even started, no one ever heard of Captain America. I mean, they heard of Captain America, but they would make a lot of fun of him, thinking he's like a C-list character. Um, they would make fun of, you know, other characters like Iron Man or Thor. No one ever knew who Guardians of the Galaxy was. Black Panther was probably just a thought. Shang-Chi, nobody knew about him either. And now look at the success that they had due to the fact that these movies were so well, well done. Um, it attracted a lot of fans and critics alike. Now with Eternals, like I said, the trailer didn't catch my attention, but I was willing to give it the benefit of doubt. I thought maybe was, this was going to be like Guardians of the Galaxy. Maybe Marvel's going to take a group of characters, a ragtag team that nobody knew about, and make into something awesome. So I saw Eternals. And you, it's so hard to see because now after watching the movie, I see why some people like it. But at the same time, I see why some people don't like it. Um, so it does have a mixed bag. The thing is what I find interesting is the fact that it does have such a low rotten score. And that's the interesting thing where I'm kind of, I am kind of surprised about. Because truth be told, again, all, in the words of John Campia, if you guys watch his show, the John Campia show, he's an awesome um, movie critic, go watch his show, go watch his channel, subscribe to him. All film and shows are subjective. You know, everybody's opinions is different. Um... What you may like, the other person may not like, and that's totally fine. All film is subjective, right? So, you know, that could even go for the Marvel movies. Um, but I did not expect Eternals to hit so low. I, Me personally, considering that film is subjective, I find it interesting that Eternals is lower than Thor The Dark World. For me, me personally, even though Eternals had its problems, and I thought it was an okay, good movie, but not my favorite. I, I personally thought Eternals was better than Thor The Dark World or Iron Man 2. And I know Thor The Dark World is like the lowest rated, well, now second lowest rated MCU movie on Rotten Tomatoes. So the fact that Eternals got lower than that kind of surprised me. So to say, I'm like, really? Because Thor The Dark World, for me personally, when I saw the movie in theaters, I was very disappointed by that movie. A lot of scenes in that movie made me cringe. It was just cringy, very cringy. And if I'm not mistaken, Iron Man 2 is in the 70 percentile range on Rotten Tomatoes. 
I think it's like the 72%. I don't know if it changed, so if you guys know about that, just let me know down in the comments below. But what, last time I checked, it was in the 72% range. Um, and for me personally, I would rather watch Eternals than Thor The Dark World or Iron Man 2. Again, that's just my opinion. But... So that's what I find kind of interesting. So as I'm watching the movie, I'm like, yeah, I can see the problems that some people have with this movie, but it's not that bad in comparison to, like, the other lower Marvel movies. That's just how I felt about it. Um, so it's interesting to see this whole divide between critics and audiences in regards to this movie. And the, the big question comes down to why. Why did Chris give it such a low score versus audiences are, because I have seen this on social media, audiences are like defending this movie, they love, not all, but most have enjoyed the movie. So why? Like what happened? Because most of the time in most Marvel movies, they do tend to be around the same, like in, in agreement with each other. The critics and the audiences tend to agree with each other, but in but the take, case of Eternals, that didn't happen. So why? Why did that happen? Um, and again, if you guys watch John Campy again, again, amazing channel, go check him out. He mentioned an interesting point. He said that for movie critics, you know, you're seeing movies constantly, like probably on a weekly basis. So you're looking for things in a movie of what you know, you're, you're, you're looking for something particular in a movie, right? That, uh, that defines the movie as to what it is, right? Because movies, shows, are considered to be a form of art, right? Movies, TV shows, you name it, are a form of art. It's film, right? Um, so for a movie critic or a show critic, they're looking for something in particular that makes you know, that makes the, the, the work that it is superb, right? Are audiences looking for those things that critics are looking for? Probably not. I don't know. If you're an audience, you know, member, maybe you are looking for things that what critics are looking for. Or if you're not, you're probably not thinking about that. You're just thinking, I just want to go and have a good time. I can care less about all the little factors and analysis here and there, you know. So, you got to think as to in perspective as to what is it that you're looking for in the movie. So that's m my take on it. And I do have to agree with that take. Maybe critics are looking for something in a particular analysis or angle that maybe audiences are not looking for. And they just want to, and audiences want to go and just have a good time. That's just me saying that again, again, I'll go back to saying this all film is subjective. Um, now, in regards to the movie Eternals, um, me personally, I'll tell you some of the things I liked and didn't like, and just be aware there will be some mild spoilers here and there, because I have to talk about what are the things I liked and didn't like. And I, again, I can see why some people may have had problems with it, but also why some people like certain moments in the movie. Again, you're going to see both sides of the coin in this movie. So starting off with like the negative side, uh, just to get that out of the way, I think the, for me, the biggest problem in this movie was, and I hear this from a lot of people, and I have to agree with them from the critics, too much story and the pacing issues. Because the Eternals have supposedly been here for like 7,000 years since ancient Mesopotamian times, throughout the whole movie, you're seeing them hop around from different time periods in different parts of the world and I feel like you don't get to really spend time with the group in that area with the people in that particular time era or civilization. Um, I think what would have worked for this movie would have been two options, all right? Option number one, if this was going to be, a, say, a movie and not a Disney Plus series, if they wanted to stay as a movie, they should have picked one time period in ancient times and stay throughout the whole movie in that time period. Kind of like Captain America the First Avenger. The majority, 95% of that movie, 
takes place during World War II. And out of all the Captain America movies, his trilogy, Captain America the First Avenger, you know, may be, a, like, the weakest one. Some people do like it. But, I mean, when you compare it to Civil War and the Winter Soldier, those two are, like, superb. But I do like some of the moments here and there in the First Avenger, and I do like the aesthetics of the whole World War II era. Steve Rogers spends most of his time in World War II. You get to meet the Howling Commandos, his love interest Peggy Carter, his commanding officer, um, played by Tommy Lee Jones, which I can't think of the char character's name. Oh, it was like Chester Phillips or something like that. But to see Steve Rogers start out his origin story in World War II, you get the idea of why his personality is the way he is, why he carries that soldier-like mentality, and why you know, his arc grows, you know, he saw things in black and white during the war, but then when he's in modern era in the sequels, you know that there's shades of gray. So that's what Eternals should have done. They should have picked one time era or time period in ancient civilizations to pick and have them stay there for the majority 95% of the movie. That's what they should have done. The first movie of Eternal should have only picked one time era instead of just hopping around from one time period to the next or from one civilization to the next because then it felt it just felt too much a bit too convoluted and because there it made it seem like there was too much story to tell that you didn't get you didn't get enough from the characters. I, I think that was one of the issues was the whole story of them moving from too many time periods, too many. It, it should have, they should have stuck to one, and it should have been one from ancient times so you could understand the origin story of the Eternals. Me personally, I would have picked the very first one when they land, right, in ancient Mesopotamia. They should have picked that one and stayed with that one. Uh, how, you know, the people in the Mesopotamian villages are probably wondering who they are, and of course they start to see them as these super highly intelligent beings, right? And that's what helps them build civilizations. I mean, just look back at, you know, your history class or, in, or history textbooks. You could probably find a whole lot of mythology from Mesopotamia. And if they had stuck with that, you know, the Eternals could have somehow been involved in that mythology of Mesopotamia. So I feel like 95% of the movie, of the first movie should have been that. Now, here's option number two. If the Eternals, you know, if the Eternals, uh, you know, writers and director wanted it to explore different time periods and travel in different parts of the world, then it should not have worked into just one movie. It should have then, then it would have come into the option of being a Disney Plus series. I feel like, again, because there was so much story and it kind of affected the pacing, it should have been a Disney Plus series so you could cover more character deaths and more character development and arcs and more um, interactions between the other characters, you know, of, as to their journeys throughout, you know, the time, different time periods in different parts of the world. It then should have been a Disney Plus series. They, Disney Plus could have probably done 10 episodes, hour long episodes. And you would have probably covered so much more. I feel that's what they should have done. Uh, so for me, the biggest thing with this movie that kind of um, had its problems was the too much story. Too much storytelling. And because there was too much storytelling, it did affect the pacing. Which then in affected the characters. You know, I feel like it did affect their, their development and their arcs and their interactions with the others. Because... Something that I also noticed that the actors, I mean, some get more screen time than others, but because there's only so much you can do due to the limited time of, uh, you know, screen time, you only get very, like, they're not on screen that long. I mean, for example, like, yeah, you get flashbacks of, to what they were doing back then, but then when it came to, like, present modern day, you, you know, they don't come to, like, halfway through the movie basically. And then some of them are not even in the final battle. Like, for example, Gilgamesh, he's not in the third act because he died. Um, Kingo, he's not in the third act because he decided not to fight, which was kind of like, oh, okay, that's a little disappointing. Um, Makari, 
you know, you see little flashbacks of her here and there, but then she doesn't come till the very end. Fasto's also his big fight's not until the very end. So it's kind of like, oh, you know, like they're they're here and there kind of thing. They're here and there, and I do feel like because there's so much story, it did affect the pacing of the movie, and it did affect the characters as well. Um, so yeah, that's just my opinion on it. Um, the only now in terms of positive as to what I see people probably liking about this movie. For one is the visuals. Chloe Zhao is known for her visual work, which is why she won the Oscar for No Man's Land. Um, the visuals here are very beautiful. I do love like the golden, you know, powers of the Eternals. Oh, it's it's beautiful. It is really beautiful. I like, and then the, I will say this. You know that I feel like the characters didn't get enough development or screen time. When they were on screen as to what you were able to get, they were pretty cool. I mean, I'm telling you now, my number one favorite Eternal would probably have to be Thena, played by Angelina Jolie. Woo! That girl. She a girl boss. She does not play. Her weapons in the movie was amazing. I love the gold designs on her sword and her shield and her little tiara and her you know she wore like beautiful she had the blonde hair and these beautiful like white dresses oh my gosh she was amazing i think she was like the for me for me she was the best character that's just me um <laughs> i she was amazing i mean you know angelina jolie's an a-list star so but she stole the show she she was amazing. She was amazing. I I loved her performance. And an interesting part of her character is that you saw her kind of go crazy, you know? She was kind of losing her sanity. And it, it, it I think it also kind of, you know, you kind of see this also in real life, too. You know, you have people who are at the, at the top of their A game, right? Athena was at the top of her A game. She was, like, the toughest warrior out there. She was named as the goddess of war, right? But she was slowly losing herself and she couldn't do what she did before. And, you know, she had Gilgamesh, her her partner in crime, right? Like, you know, there to take care of her. And then when he was gone, who was there to take care of her? I mean, yeah, she had the other Eternals, but she he was like her, her best friend. So, it, I, you know, I feel like her story was, it was really tragic. It was really tragic. So I liked her character a lot. I liked her story a lot too. So yeah, she, she was cool. I like, I like Dina a lot. She was like the best. My second one would probably have to be Makari. I thought she was really cool. Very lovely. In the words of Druig, my beautiful, beautiful Makari, which I'm not gonna lie. Woo! Druig and Makari. That's the, my second positive thing about this movie, are the ships. <laughs> People are, like, shipping, like, you know, certain pairings here in this movie. You got Druig and Makari, you got Athena and Gilgamesh, and, of course, you got Icarus and Circe. Um, the funny thing is, the whole movie of Eternals, supposedly their main couple was supposed to be Icarus and Cersei, which don't get me wrong, I think Richard Madden and Gemma Chan are very beautiful, uh, handsome human beings, alright? They, they do make a hot couple, don't get me wrong. They even had a whole love scene in the movie, right? But the couple that stole the show for me, that is now my OTP in the Marvel Universe, is Makari and Druig. Oh my gosh. Who oh, they they had sparks. They had chemistry. I mean, and I have seen some people like on social media say like you give a whole love scene to Icarus and Cersei, but not even like a small kiss between Druig and Makari. Like that is a crime against huma humanity and it is. Druig and Makari are goals. They are goals. Oh my gosh. And every time Druig would look at Makari <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And the way Druig would say Makari's name, again, if you guys see that clip when he's like, my beautiful, beautiful Makari, did you miss me? It's like, oh my gosh. There were sparks. There were sparks flying. And truth be told, I didn't know about this, 
but originally, like, they weren't supposed to be, like, a pairing in the movie, but when Chloe Zhao saw the actor's chemistry behind the scenes, she was like, oh, yeah, like, we're gonna pair you guys up, and, like, yes, yes, and they do stay together at the end of the movie, they're on the ship of the Eternals, so hopefully down the road of the MCU, we'll see those two together again, and we'll get more flirty scenes between them, because fans are, like, amazed by their chemistry i'm amazed by their chemistry i want more i want more oh my gosh i'm sorry icarus and cersei you know you guys are a hot couple and all but the one who stole the show was druig and makari druig and makari that's all i'm gonna say like for me that was the best part of the eternals was druig and makari their their relationship and being his action scenes so yeah i mean i feel like in terms of like what made some like this movie work was uh, i guess you could say like the characters and the relationships and the action scenes were pretty good i'm not gonna lie their action was pretty good um but yeah so again i could see some negatives i could see some positives in this movie i'm not gonna go into detail like a whole review as to like oh like why the eternals came here how does the movie end um but i could see so again i i could see some positive and negatives and then for me those were my negatives and positives in regards to the movie one more negative that i was going to say were the deviants a lot of critics um are saying that the deviants were underused and i totally have to agree i feel like the deviants could have done more like i don't know like when i think now back on the story because when i think back on the story i feel like you really i don't know i i like What's his name again? Um, Arsham. Arsham, one of the Celestials. When you really discover his whole plan and mission to bring birth to a new Celestial within planet Earth, the whole thing I'm thinking about is like, so why were the Deviants sent also? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, I don't know. There's just, again, pacing issues, story issues, some things that also just didn't add up. If you guys understood it, just let me know down, down in the comments below. And yes, there is a whole scene of exposition of when he's explaining it to Cersei as to what his whole plan was. But it just didn't make sense. Like, I feel like I had to think about it several times to, like, have it click in my head, if that makes any sense. Um, but yeah, I had some issues with the Deviants. I felt like they were totally underused. Um, and also, the whole idea... Someone also said this, like, the whole idea of the Celestial being born inside the Earth. You would think, like, the, the, the scale of this event is, like, Armageddon-level, apocalyptic-level type of an event. The way that it's treated in the movie, it feels so small-scale. Maybe because maybe cause it's only the Eternals, and maybe because other Avengers are not aware of it, it makes it feel so small-scale. I don't know. It, it, and it does. I do have to agree with that. It does. Um, but yeah, again, I, I think for me, there was a lot of story and pacing, too much story and a lot of pacing issues that make, that made this a negative for the movie. But then at the same time, there were some like positive moments. I think the effects were really nice and the ships were really nice. So yeah, you know, it has its pros, but it has its cons kind of thing. Um, and again, should you go out and see this movie? I'll, I'll leave that up to you. I feel like you should go see this movie because if you want to go for the Marvel experience, you should give it a try. You might like it, and hey, you might not like it. Again, that's up to you. All film is subjective. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Um, I have nothing else more to say other than just giving you my thoughts as to why there is this whole divide kind of thing. Truth be told, I kind of wish this movie... What a missed opportunity. I do think this movie should have either been a Disney Plus series or should have only taken place in one time period and have stuck with that time period for 95% of the movie. And then when the sequel comes around, then the sequel could be focused on modern day. Kind of like Captain America, right? First movie took place in World War II, second movie took place in modern era. But that's what they should have done. But oh well, who am I to judge? Now, here's the thing. Do you guys think this movie will get a sequel, considering as to how things are going? Will Chloe Zhao come back to return due to the, due to the reception that it's having? You guys let me know down in the comments below, and let me know who is your favorite Eternals character. So yes, please let me know, like, and subscribe, and as always, take care guys. Bye!